Okay. Um, so uh, to get us started, I'm going to introduce Donna and Dr. Emily. Uh, Donna Jensen is the founder of Time to Tell. Hi, Donna. Um, the author of Healing My Life from Incest to Joy and playwright of What She Knows, One Woman's Way Through Incest to Joy. She has been leading writing workshops for survivors since 2008. Being a feminist activist since 1971, she has found writing to be a fabulous way to heal her trauma, strengthen her voice, and open her heart. And Chell did pop in a link for us um, that you can go to www.timetotell.org to learn more. We also have co-hosting with us today, Dr. Emily Samuelson, who is a psychologist, survivor, and a passionate advocate on behalf of sexually abused children and adult survivors. Her book, Soaring Above the Ashes, Thriving Beyond Childhood Sexual Abuse, has the stories and faces of men and women, including herself, who have worked their way from helplessness to empowerment. Um, writing the book, helping to deepen her understanding of the healing process, discover and embrace all parts of herself and speak the truth to power. And uh, my name is Artisa Hill and I am with New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Thank you for joining us. I do have our communications director with us today, Chell Miller, and also Chris is also with us on this call. So um, I'm gonna now allow Donna to go ahead and take it over and let us know why we're gathering today. Yes, well, <clears throat> thank you, Artisha. It's good to be back with all of you at uh, Niscasa. Um, I wanna say basically what we're going to do is uh, we're going to view a very short excerpt of my play which I used in my work with the young men at Stetson School. Um, and then we're gonna show a, a eight minute film of my interviews of clinicians at the Stetson School. And you'll get an opportunity to go into a breakout group with four or five others in the, the seminar today to talk amongst yourselves about what you saw and what you're thinking. And then we'll come back for as much of a large group discussion as we can have and feedback. And uh, that's, oh, and also um, Emily's gonna talk some about the dynamics of empathy because it's very clear to me that the purpose of my work, uh, especially when um, presenting for people who have done harm is the need to reconnect with their sense of empathy, which is often lost and necessary for their own healing and change of behavior. So, but before, before we go into it, I'd like to ask people that are present, if you wouldn't just put in the chat your name, um, where you work and what population you work with so that everybody here can kind of get a sense of who's here. Um, I'm not going to read them all out, but it'll be a chance for all of you to read what each other is putting in. So I, I invite you to do that now. Again, it's your name, uh, where you work, and what population you work with. Um, so I want to say that, uh, oh, Wow. Also, I want you to have a pen and paper close at hand in a bit. We're going to have you do a writing response to the first excerpt we um, play for you. And oh, and here's a bunch of wow. statewide advocacy for survivors and with survivors and in prison, folks with prison and in jail. So just take a look at what all your colleagues are putting in. And by the way, I want to say an incredibly heartfelt thanks and appreciation to every single one of you for the work that you do. Mm -hmm. As an incest survivor, it means a great deal to me that you're trying to turn the tide with your work. And it's not easy work by any means. So welcome all. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Emily, for 
some remarks. Okay. Um, well, today we're our plan is um, to be able to use the art of storytelling um, and art to reach offenders. Um, Donna, you'll be seeing a clip from Donna's play, which is about telling her story. Um, what's powerful about storytelling is that it allows us to connect with a character from a distance. So it's, it's more like opening the door a crack rather than a face-to-face -face interaction or confrontation. Uh, stories speak to us on a metaphorical level so that messages can get through that might not be heard if they were spelled out in an outline of facts. And this I think is pretty fascinating. When we're listening to a story, there are more parts of our brain that light up um, as if we are experiencing the same thing as the, the different characters in the, um, in the story or the play. Um, we have mirror neurons in our brain that literally re react as if we're going through the very same experience. And it's as if we're in the story. Um, and uh, another interesting thing about storytelling, at least it's interesting to me, I hope it will be to you, is that scientists are discovering that chemicals, different chemicals uh, get uh, fired in our system, in our brain, when we're told a story. Chemicals like cortisol, uh, dopamine, and to me, what's most important for today is oxytocin, which is called the bonding hormone. Um, it's associated with empathy, which is obviously a really important part of building relationships. And all of that happens just from listening to a story. So. That's it. Thanks, Sam. You bet. Yeah. So um, uh, what we're going to show you first is one excerpt of my play, which <clears throat> actually I had a, a reading that I did for the Massachusetts Association of Therapists that work with sex offenders. I'm not sure if I've got it exactly right, but that's what that was. <laughs> and it was a way, way long ago, uh, probably eight or nine years ago. And uh, the clinical director for Stetson School that works with uh, boys and youth from 21 down to eight who have been, uh, who have done harm, uh, stood up at the back of the room and said, you must come to Stetson because I keep trying to figure out how to get them to feel empathy and you're going to do that. So, and I ended up going back for seven years in a row to, to see, to show my play and have a dialogue with the boys and the young men. So what I want to show you first is just an excerpt of the play that kind of gives you a flavor for what it was they saw. And when the excerpt is done, it's just three minutes, <clears throat> I want you to pick up your pen and just write down in a couple of minutes whatever your reaction is to seeing this excerpt, okay? So let's go right ahead to <clears throat> the excerpt. And... <laughs> We were going for a family picnic to a park that has a river with rapids. Dad brought home an inner tube after work the day before. Mom says we're gonna have lots of fun. We get to the park and find a picnic table. Lots of families are there. They've got inner tubes too. Mom's gonna set up the picnic while Dad and I ride down the river on our inner tube. Dad and I head to the water. I'm so excited I'm running, which means my seven-year-old body is keeping up with Dad for once. He walks really fast. We have to walk a long way from Mom. 
I keep looking back at her. She's unpacking the cardboard box with our picnic stuff. She waves at me every time I look back. We reach the river and step in. Dad sits in the inner tube with his arms and legs hanging over the sides, and he puts me on top of him. We start floating. There's lots of people around, yelling and splashing. The pace gets a little bit rushier. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. The water is taking us faster and faster, and something's getting creepy. Something hard is growing underneath me. He's holding me around my middle and pressing me down onto the hard thing. We come to a big dip in the water with rocks on either side of us. My stomach feels like it's full of cement. Then right in the middle of the dip, Dad lets go of me so he can balance the tube. I jump off him onto a big flat rock. I scrape my shin sliding down it. Now my arms are lying on top of the rock and my body's kind of floating underneath and I'm kind of stunned. I hear people yelling, the water's cold, but I'm starting to calm down. And somebody gets me out of the water. I don't know who. Dad and I walk up to the picnic table. He's cursing. For Christ's sake, she wouldn't jumped right off me. She wouldn't have got her legs hurt if she hadn't jumped off me. Mom doesn't say anything. As I sit on the picnic bench, she kneels down in front of me with my feet in her lap and gently holds a towel on my shins. Dad walks off to have a cigarette. All right, so I want you to pick up your pens or pencils and I want you to write for two minutes whatever you're feeling or thinking right now from watching that excerpt. Thanks. Okay, Emily. Okay, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, empathy and what the experience was like for me and points that I think um, are points where it's, uh, the, the experience is charged in a way that can evoke um, emotion. Um, For example, um, the character says, and I could keep up with him for once, you know, like, which gives the picture in, in one's mind of, you know, the little kid running. Be, and, and it also says something about how the father's not attuned to the child's needs at all. So it's a, a point of a lack of empathy. Um, uh, the character's confusion and that icky feeling about the hard thing and what it is. And then her desperate attempt to escape and anything to get away. And, um, and then in her escape, she got hurt. Um, when the character talks about, um, well, somebody helped me, I don't know who kind of another place where there's a lack of empathy. Um, and I kind of identified um, that, that the, that the child is being pulled out by someone, anyone, but it's not the father. Um, and then of course, um, mom, the mom says absolutely nothing. Another failure of empathy. Um, and the way that the father 
uses the child and then blames her for the for her reaction to the abuse uh, is kind of a typical maneuver, which I'm sure you find often where um, offenders will not take any accountability or, or really any responsibility for their behavior. Um, and then of course he walks off to have a cigarette, which I never thought about it until just now how, you know, the kind of the classic roll over and have a cigarette, mm. um, ugh, which is really very creepy. I, as you can tell by the way I'm talking and responding, um, I really felt a lot about what was happening in the story. Um, and I guess I must have a lot of mirror neurons <laughs> because what mirror neurons do is they, there are specific, there are neurons in the brain that um, when they're seeing or hearing somebody in action, the mirror neurons, it says, it, take in the experience and it is if the, their brain, the, the viewer's brain is activated in the same way it would be if they were actually going through the experience. Mm -hmm. So I think I have an overabundance of those, <laughs> um, but that's good. Um, one of the things that I find has been really difficult working with, um, with kids and adults and a couple of offenders um, is that if someone has never received empathy, they don't know what that experience is. Mm -hmm. They don't get the chance to internalize it. It's, it's like um, when, if you never have the experience of protection, of loving protection um, and experience it on the receiving end, you don't get to bring it inside and internalize it. And I think it's the same, it, that's the dynamic that happens with empathy. If you never receive it, you, you don't know what it is. And you certainly don't learn by modeling or, or receiving, you know, by role modeling um, from someone else or um, receiving it in order to be able to integrate it inside of yourself. Um, so as clinicians or people interacting with um, offenders, we, we really need to be able to draw on our own empathy for our clients um, so that they have that experience. It's not the same as, as um, excusing what they've done or um, you know, making excuses for inappropriate behavior. It's more ab about trying to find a way in to connect with somebody so they finally can be seen and heard in a way that most likely they haven't experienced before. So what, what I try to do, and it's a major challenge sometimes because countertransference is so strong. You know, those of us in that in these kind of in the professions we're in, where we tend to kind of identify more and have more empathy for the for the victim, which is appropriate. So we have to be so careful not to get into splitting or not to let our rage or anger or disgust for the acts that, that offenders have done um, because then we're lost and, the, and the, our client is lost. They can't gain from us because uh, a lot of people have, people have trauma and I'm assuming for many people, for many of the offenders, there's a history of trauma or, you know, active trauma or neglect. Um, they um, haven't been on the receiving end of a kind of open heartedness and compassion that in the way I see things it, in terms of treatment. 
is so important. Uh, and there are different ways that we can establish connections with our clients um, in addition to being uh, open hearted and having some compassion and empathy for their struggles. Uh, we can make adjustments in the tone of voice. Uh, we can slow down the tone. We can speak in a way that is maybe almost hypnotic and with an emphasis on certain words that demonstrate a caring and uh, acceptance, things like that. Um, if we're able to match the client's rhythm and kind of be at the same energy level that they are, that non-verbally helps facilitate a connection. But we can't stay there because uh, people who aren't able to regulate their own um, internal uh, systems, what we can do if we match them is for people who are agitated or hyped up, we can match them and then slowly bring it down. And as we do that, if we maintain connection, our clients will start to calm down. Also for those people who are uh, hypoactive and kind of in a collapsed state, if we meet them there, we can help bring them back up uh, to a, a better range, a, a more, um, I don't want to say better, but a healthier range of um, responses. And body language is really uh, crucial because the communication happens on the nonverbal level much more than it does. Words are words. And they're, I'm a word person. I love words. But I know that if somebody uses words, but their nonverbal behavior is saying something different, the message on the nonverbal level is the message that comes through. And M, yeah, we have to go to the film. Okay. Sorry, right. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's okay. You're going to get another chunk of time to talk more about dealing with the clients. Okay. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> She's got lots to teach us. Yeah. So now what we're going to do is we're going to watch an eight minute film of interviews with clinicians at the Stetson School after I had been doing a performance annually for about three years. And so they have a lot to say about what it has meant for them to use the experience of the boys watching the play and dialoguing with me. Um, and so here we go. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. One time I was driving a student home to his new placement and we were talking about his time at Stetson and I was asking him about what were some of the most significant you know, turning points for him and his treatment. And especially when did he start realizing um, what he had done, the impact that it could have had or had mm -hmm. on his brothers. And he said, well, I remember Donna's presentation. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, damn, why doesn't he remember what I said? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he was like, you know, I remember Donna's presentation. Huh. And when he hadn't been sexually abused himself, but uh -huh. when he heard about what it meant for you, yeah. he realized, the significance that it could, you know, uh -huh. play in someone's life. Uh -huh. Another um, piece of it is that sometimes it's a not unusual for the kids to abuse someone who's five or six, for example. Right. And when they're siblings, there's pressure, I think, on the survivor to, by the family sometimes, to give the sense of, I'm okay, it's all right, you know, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And, um, sometimes the client doesn't really understand the significance of it and doesn't understand that it's going to be a process for the person they hurt. Yeah. So I'll refer back to your presentation and explain, you know, 
Donna was a child when this happened. Now she's an adult. She's still going through the healing process. And one of the kids in group brought up um, how you're still having to work on it and heal from it years and years later. It also reminds me that this is prevention work. This is, mm -hmm. you know, working here is, and working with kids who sexually abused people is a part of prevention so that people like you, you know, don't have to go up and tell the story anymore, you know, to try to like um, stop people from being, more people from being harmed. I did the your performance with two very different groups of students each time. I did it with a group of students who were very new to Stetson and just starting in their treatment. And then a group of students who had been here for a little while, but were between the ages of nine and 11. Um, so from adolescents who are beginning treatment to children who are sort of in the middle of treatment. And, uh, you know, I think for the, the kids just starting in treatment, I, I do think that it kind of kickstarted something for them that, that we find tends to take a while here. Really a, an extremely useful process for us in terms of gauging where a kid is at um, and based on his emotional response to the performance. Um, if a kid is, you know, has that guard up and that mask up and doesn't want to, you know, really doesn't demonstrate kind of empathy or really, you know, I don't care about this. We can kind of use it as a tool in that way to really challenge the kid and, mm -hmm. and sort of, um, is, is my assessment of how this kid is responding to treatment accurate. Um, and then for kids who have been, um, you know, accepting responsibility right along, it can be a useful tool for them in those other ways too. And, and again, as a clinician, kind of gauging their emotional response to the presentation in terms of what does that mean for them? You know, the kid who's crawling in his tall boy, um, Obviously, there was an emotional response when the kids are bringing up something that's bothering them or something they're really sad about, you know, with a family or their past behaviors or anything like that. And they start getting kind of emotional. Like, I mean, you'll hear, you know, your student and other students, it's okay to cry. Like, you can do that, mm -hmm. you know, and like, I don't, I don't think I would have heard that before your performance. I think it would have still been like, what's the matter with you? You know, man up, <laughs> you know? One, one guy, like, you know, I think a few hours later, he like crawled inside his tall boy. <laughs> and uh, his, and his tall boy, his I guess boy. like the bureau. Yeah, yeah. Cause he was, it, it, it's, that was it, uh, your performance really, really uh, impacted. And it's funny, it was one of the guys that, uh, you know, um, in his assessment, it, it's, uh, uh, it was observed that uh, he didn't really show a lot of remorse and he, he seemed to be pretty detached from, uh, you know, what he did and the impact that uh, his behaviors had. And uh, and as it turned out, that, that really was a turning point for him because I think he was, you know, we, we realized that he... Uh, he did really care. And actually he was just, he just didn't really want to go there, you know, right. during the early stages of the treatment, but he was able to, and he's, he's doing really good now. I know that you had said in your play, if, if your father had only just admitted it, it would have been so much easier for you to heal. And so mm -hmm. I think that I use that a lot too, that it's really important for you guys to be honest so that the victim can get help and remember what Donna said about if she only heard that, then she would have been able to heal. And that's been really powerful with them mm -hmm. taking increased responsibility and moving along, along in their treatment. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, um, and the last time that you that you performed, I've a lot of the kids that we have here have been sexually abused. And um, so the theme of your play, a lot of it was it's not your fault, or it's not my fault. And so one of the kids right after the session, I could tell that he, he looked a little bit emotional during the play. And so afterward, I met with him and he said, um, people have told me that it's not my fault. But I, I think now I finally believe it. Some of the kids we have feel incredibly remorseful and sad and ashamed about what they did. And and for them, the play really, it really, I think, spoke to the fact that they can help in the healing process despite what they did. I had a similar situation with a student who um, it led to him and his mom talking about her abuse, which he didn't know about. 
um, because he he said I went to this assembly and this woman came and she presented the story of what happened in her family and his mom started to cry and said to him you know this is what happened you know this is what your grandfather did and for him that was really um, a really powerful piece because mm -hmm. he he got this whole, whole very I think in the moment um, confusing experience of I did this to my brother my grandfather did, did this to my mother um, and drawing those connections between him and his grandfather and mm -hmm. Uh, and then his mother talking with him about um, kind of what I said before, saying to him, you know, but you're different because you're here, you're mm -hmm. you're trying to not hurt people again. Mm -hmm. And it was really powerful for him to be able to, you know, differentiate himself, say, OK, I'm not, you know, my grandfather, the abuser, and I'm not who I was when I offended my brother. I'm trying to be this other person. And I don't think we we would have gotten there, or we would would have taken us. Who knows whether we would have gotten there mm -hmm. if if there wasn't this story, your story, of like a real person for him to say to his mom, you know, this is what you know I'm, this woman said, and it triggered um, you know the whole discussion. You're just, I say, you are just. It's what's the opposite of breaking a heart? I am just. It means so much to me to hear these stories. I mean, it's why I'm doing the work, but I thank you. So <clears throat> welcome back. Now, what we're going to do is uh, you're going to be put into um, breakout rooms of five each. Um, I noticed there are no cameras on. I want to encourage you to put your cameras on if you can in your breakout group so you can actually uh, see each other and have a conversation. Um, and so talk about whatever it is you want to talk about, and then we'll come back together in 10 minutes and see what kind of dialogue people want to offer up to the whole group, to Emily and I, and there you go. Welcome back, folks. Um, we had folks gathered in three breakout rooms with maximum of four people in each. So we'd like each of you um, in each of your groups, if one person would be willing to share some of the impressions that you had, maybe some questions that you had. Um, if you could please share by, you know, turning your camera on if you're comfortable, but We'd love to hear your voice if you're able to. So please, uh, what were some of the impressions that, that you had had? Perhaps we'll start with um, breakout group one. Let's see who was in that group. Or if anyone would like to chime in with some of the impressions that you had had. We would love to hear from you. I'll just say something from our group. I don't know what number we were. So maybe that's, we were one. That's I don't perfect. know. Um, Tia, Chloe, and I had just talked about how um, we talked about a few things, but primarily just sometimes that need for validation of for our victims to hear their abusers admit what they did was wrong, or even if they admit it, just to stop making excuses about it and to, to sort of understand from their pers perspective and how sometimes, a lot of times they just, they don't get that. And the healing process mm -hmm. is so much harder mm -hmm. when without that validation. And um, so that just sort of, I guess, stuck with us. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I can go next. Um, I met with Lucy and Amber, um, and I ended up talking probably more. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, but I was talking a little bit. I do Title IX work on a university campus, and just um, it's a funny position because you know you have to present as neutral, um, but still trying to be 
trauma informed and how I can be that, you know, have that level of being neutral trauma informed for both the accused, the victim, and then also, you know, with college students who might be witness to these um, incidents in some capacity or another. And so just thinking through um, those conversations, it's kind of a weird line that I walk because <laughs> can't really go one way or the other. But um, so just kind of thinking through that a little bit and we were just kind of processing through, um, yeah, trauma-informed. And I think it was Lucy who said I should watch the documentary, The Wisdom of Trauma. So um, she recommended that, okay. so thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Would anyone else like to share some of their reflections? Um, I can go. We kind of talked about like, uh, so I work with folks who are currently incarcerated and we just talked about like how there isn't a whole lot of conversation around working with folks who have caused harm and like what that looks like and how, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that punitive like justice lock them away answer as much as like accountability and like you know saying like I did a harm and looking at like the systemic issues that cause that harm because I know it was mentioned in there like a lot of times like folks are doing these things because that's what was done to them and that was like generationally just kind of what happened so we talked a lot about that and about how you know, just because of like all of the events of the last year, how conversations have been um, centered around like implicit biases and stuff. And a lot of times it's almost the safe answer to be like, oh, well, I have a bias against, you know, folks who molest children because like it's no one's going to stand up and be like, that's what I think is cool. Um, and, you know, so I think it's like really important to have these conversations and like acknowledge that bias, especially if you're going to be doing the work, because you're not going to get anywhere doing the work if that's just like your where where you feel safe and that's your bias and um, I don't know less of that like it's my job to fix or change this person and more of like I am helping this person understand and acknowledge that they did harm in the world. Exactly. Great. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, we also touched on how frustrating it can be at times when um, an organization really doesn't support the, the depth of work that frontline people are, are in the depth, you know, are in the trenches doing and that the need for the need for ongoing supervision and support and, and, a, and, a, and a space to vent and a space to acknowledge the challenges of working with systems like docs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, were there any other reflections, um, especially, you know, as you're hearing from some of your peers? I think for me personally, it seems like many, at least in this space, a lot of the people who are most close to, you know, working with people who might have caused harm, at least in this group, or like some of the folks working with incarcerated people, you know, some of whom may have experienced harm, some of whom may have caused harm. Um, I assist our PREA outreach director with some of that work. And, you know, there are folks who have caused harm and are working through healing too. So I think it's, yeah, really wonderful to hear, um, you know, this Dr. Samuelson, especially, um, you know, bringing this focus to building empathy, you know, how do we encourage that among like, ourselves as, you know, people who are supporting other people and also the folks that we work with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, folks. I apologize for dropping an acronym too. I should say it's the Department of Corrections because some people might be calling in from places where that's not an acronym they're familiar with. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Were there folks that had ongoing questions, you know, or you know, maybe questions even for our guest speakers or just more broadly, like where do we go from here? I, 
I guess I would have a question as far as like, where do we go from here? If you are like working within an organization that might not necessarily be supportive, like how, how do you start that conversation to be like, this is the work we're doing. We have to do it. And I know that's a loaded and hard question, but. Can I first ask, uh, first Gina, thanks for the question. When you say, who is it you're going to be asking so in this situation, I think it's more like it, like internal management mm -hmm. that might not necessarily have the buy-in to be working with folks who have like caused harm and is just kind of like, yeah, this is something that we do, but there isn't like a whole lot of support around like finding, mm -hmm. finding trainings, trainings like this or like external support of like, yes, this is hard, but like, there's a way to look at it. That's not all like very sad and frustrating. Right. So uh, I, I'm sure, I, and I know Emily's got a, a, some thoughts. And I just want to say one thing. I think it can be very useful to report back to your management team in as much time as they'll give you with as extensive an explanation as possible this experience. You know, so. Ms. Casa had this uh, workshop. We spent this time doing that. Um, it was extremely helpful and productive, blah, 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 blah. You know, the, to show them there's, there's actually this work is happening mm -hmm. can sometimes be illuminating uh, for managers that they've got a, a lot of stuff that they're trying to manage, of course. But anyway, but Emily, what, what thoughts do you have about this? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about how incredibly difficult it is to change systems <laughs> and change points of view. And I think, you know, your suggestion of trying to find a way to share what um, we've talked about today or what this workshop has been about um, is really, you know, it's a way to start to ed ed maybe, maybe open some eyes about it. Um, and I was thinking about the, the film, um, who's then the title I might have wrong, Into the Circle. I don't know if anybody's seen that. I think that's what it's called. It, it's uh, referred to in the, the movie, The Wisdom of Trauma, but it's a woman who goes into the prison system and everybody's outside all the, um, uh, incarcerated men are outside in a really big circle. And she asks, you know, if anybody has been um, screamed at when they were a kid, take a step into the circle and you kind of watch people step in. If anybody was beaten and it's, it's a way of getting, of helping the the, the guys recognize that they're not alone. And, um, and also a chance to share, like you get to see what's behind um, their offending behavior. And it's a very moving film. And I think that's what it's called. I wish I could tell you for sure, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that in terms of incarcerated folks. Oh, somebody just, thank you. The Compassion Prison Project .org. Thank you, Chow. It's and I, I would add that, that that empathy exercise, that compassion exercise is useful for those of us outside of the prison walls as well. I've I've done that that in a circle at a spiritual community where we really wanted the community to grapple with racism and classism and other issues that had cause pain and harm to folks and that not everybody was on the same equity level mm -hmm. and there was just this this side of like a lot of blind spots in the in the in the management in the organizing committee and by doing that circle it really opened up some windows for people to see better yeah that's that's great Okay, so this is Donna. Um, 
is there anything else from the group about what we've sort of covered so far? You could also put it in the chat if you'd like. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily. who has got a few more things to share about this, these okay. dynamics of empathy. Yes, the dynamics of empathy. Um, I was just noticing <clears throat> uh, when the um, in the second clip that Donna showed of the uh, staff at the Stetson, how one of the staff mentioned that you know a, a boy remembered the play and shared it with somebody else. I, th I think I remember seeing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of preoccupied when that was going on, but just kind of obviously the the play had a lot of meaning and he connected to it and it was kind of integrated <clears throat> inside of him and then um, he empathically shared it with somebody else. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated you know, recognizing uh, how somebody else might be feeling. So I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I just want to check about how much time I've got. <laughs> uh, uh, let's say 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that's obviously really challenging in the work that we do with um, offenders, especially, is how to foster empathy in the client for others, but also self-compassion, empathy for themselves, which is not the same as making excuses for them. It's helping tap into uh, recognizing their own vulnerability. And when people are defended or protected against owning their own vulnerability, it makes it that much harder to recognize it in other people. And it also can uh, create a desire to hurt the vulnerable um, because the vulnerable person is reflecting back to somebody that they're vulnerable and the offender doesn't want to get anywhere near that. Um, for obviously, uh, for obvious, um, emotional protection. Um, one of the things that I, I remember doing um, when I was uh, working at a school for disturbed kids, um, this is not an offender, but uh, here was the experience. Um, I was working with a little boy who was eight or nine years old and he, he finally disclosed for the first time in, in a therapy um, session that he, he had been sexually abused by some older teenage boys when he was five. And in the way that uh, many boys and men uh, attack themselves, I should have, you know, I should have fought them off. Um, because the vulner is too awful to claim their victimhood and vulnerability. So there's this uh, wish that I could have been strong enough to fight them off. <clears throat> and he was really angry at himself that he didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, when he said that he was five, when it happened, I said, you feel like taking a stroll with me down the hall? And we walked down the hall to the kindergarten class. And we looked in the class and I said, how old are those kids? He said, five. And boom, it clicked for him that it was impossible for him to protect himself from the older boys. And, and he could respond with uh, that empathy or self-compassion. And uh, it was a real breakthrough moment for him. Um, sometimes what I do with clients is um, I asked them to bring in pictures from childhood and I work um, as hard as I can to help people connect with that part of themselves or the many parts of themselves um, who are vulnerable uh, 
you know, people call, you know, it's called inner child work. I know it sounds hokey, but it's very powerful. And um, it's a way of integrating um, the experience and providing what wasn't provided for the child when they were in uh, distress or being abused. Um, sometimes when people are so angry at themselves, I, I have a client who um, is angry at her three-year-old self for not getting herself out of the situation. <laughs> and she knows it's irrational, but she still feels it. She's so, you know, we, sometimes imagining somebody else in the same situation, someone they love in that situation can help uh, begin to crack open that uh, rage or denial. Um, and I, I wanna mention that uh, Donna and I were in a, um, a weekend um, adventure. <laughs> Uh, it was a dialogue project for, uh, uh, presented by uh, or set up by Stop It Now, an organization um, that works to stop sexual abuse by working with offenders or those who might offend. Anyway, it was a weekend where there were four women survivors and four male offenders. And we sat in rooms together and it was had a dialogue. And um, it was very powerful. And the, you know, all the women were all like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And we were scared. Did I say too much? Was this okay? And we were, you know, anxious because it meant confronting uh, our own abuser in some way by talking with them. And there's one moment that I will never forget. And it was a guy in there with his slick back hair and his kind of pointy toe shoes. And he said, you know, I, I ended up in, in prison because of what I did to my daughter, you know. Uh, her mother didn't know, but she told her best friend and her best friend told her own mother and her mother told my wife. And um, I ended up in jail this is the moment. I was so proud of her for telling. Mm. I wish I could have told when I was a little boy. I've never forgotten that dual consciousness of the guy. You know, on the one hand, he's offends, and on the other, he's proud of his daughter for speaking up, which ended up, you know. It, which ended up putting him in prison. Um, that duality of, uh, uh, for him, I'm not saying all offenders have that, but uh, there's so much more that's in there to connect with if um, we take our time and kind of weasel our way in, in a way, <laughs> through different techniques that we use. So, um, I think having those dialogues, and I guess when you're a therapist working with offenders, you know you are having a dialogue. It's a different form of a dialogue. Um, and what what with in this case with the uh, workshop, people in the workshop um, began to realize the impact of the pain that they caused because they could see in the four of us women how awful that was for us and how traumatizing and, and how lifelong the damage was. And um, so I'm, I'm, I think, you know, Donna's film uh, about her play is, can be really powerful in that way, helping people have um, more empathy for uh, victims. So, okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, I just want to check in if anybody has any questions or comments about what Emily just put forth. I want to give you a moment to either put it in the chat box or speak up.
This is Chell. Um, while folks are thinking, I just wanted to share, you know, I really appreciate Emily sh mentioning um, the work she did with Stop It Now. Um, I just shared the link in the chat. Um, they also offer resources for people who've done harm or who are at risk of hurting somebody, um, you know, to really, you know, intervene before anything happens. Um, so I shared the link to some of the resources in the chat um, that they've created. You know, it's really like they've got a helpline specifically for that. Um, you know, they've got a bunch of resources about, you know, disrupting their behaviors and, you know, getting out of situations where they may have in the past um, done harm or feel more at risk of doing harm. So thank you for highlighting that as well. Oh yeah. And Donna, Donna was the person who invited, who let them know about me. So that's how I got into the workshop. So thank you, Donna. So <clears throat> thank you, Chell, for bringing that up as well about um, the ongoing work that Stop It Now continues to do. Uh, please note that our prevention director, Sarah Podber, has led uh, circles of safety training in collaboration with them. Um, has hosted, I should say, she's she's hosted those trainings that Stop It Now have led through Niscosta. Just last year, we did a series of them for our prevention folks out there. Um, and we, we can certainly um, link people up with more of that kind of training if there's interest in the future. We, we are both, she and I are both trained in that circles of safety mm -hmm. curriculum and, you know, please let us know if that's something you want to see us repeat in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Emily and Donna for bringing all that you've been bringing up. There's a, such a rich conversation. I, I could come up with a lot of questions, but I want to leave it open for our people here. But if you have one, you can go right ahead and ask it. Oh. You just want to be open to everybody else coming in. I understand. Uh, so, if we're not getting other questions from the group, the one other thing I want to bring up today, which I think is at least as important, if not more important than all the work that you are doing, is self-care. Self-care for people <clears throat> who are doing this work. Um, I. I can't say it strong enough. Um, what we're doing, what all of us are doing in paying attention to this issue, these issues, is extremely important and extremely taxing. And we tend to, the people in this room, I would not be surprised, are a lot of caregivers a lot of caretakers, okay, um, who tend to put themselves last. And I really want to encourage you to put yourself first. I know, you know, it's like the, um, you know, on the airplane, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you do it on, um, before you do it on, on someone with you. Um, so I just want to say, um, what I would really like is what's always so helpful is if people would either open up their mics and say a particular self care activity that is restorative for you, uh, that would be my first, um, choice. If not, I, I invite you to put it in the chat. But I really think it's important to share with each other what what self care activities. If we aren't doing them all the time, we know we should be. <laughs> Emily, did you have? I was going to say I don't know if chocolate counts as self care. I think it absolutely does. I take great care of myself in that case. <laughs> And so Amy is saying reading, walks, hiking, cuddling my kiddos. Yes, yes, absolutely. Great, Amy. Acupressure from Jessica. Great. Yes. Um, 
this is chill for me it's often just sitting with my cat or playing with her sitting with you just bonding yes reflecting from the natural world with people yes that's right chris getting outside even if it's only for five minutes and looking at the sky um anything else people can put in here so for me it's uh, it, this is gina um like physical activity especially like i've been i just moved to a new house and i've been like remodeling things and i swear like deconstructing something is so nice like yes. that that feeling it's great yes yes singing dancing stretching yes i agree i love singing and dancing especially in my kitchen and my car mm -hmm. and yes music all kinds of music to play all kinds of music um we're getting I've a great started, here yeah i've started gardening oh, yeah. thank you to chris for sharing plants with me for uh -huh. my new garden yeah great great yeah i'm so excited my all my seeds are blossoming you know they're coming up and i actually have a tomato and yeah. it's very healing for me to right. connect in that way i'd like to mention something that i try to remember to do on my good days and that is um tapping on acupressure points um it, there's uh, there are many videos on youtube about tapping while you say certain things um, and I can put my life on the line here for most people. It's incredibly helpful. I can't say I understand why it is as effective as it is, but if I'm feeling, you know, keyed up or anxious, I'll do a little bit of tapping and I just feel my body settle down. I, so, I try to do a lot of body oriented things. So, Emily, well, we've got some time here. Why don't you teach us one? Well, I can, yeah, I've got a real simple one. That's um, what I like. Yeah, yeah. It's Easy to remember. Yeah. Um, if you, this is not tapping, but it's a version of it. Um, if you take whatever, whichever hand you want and put it over your belly button. Everybody do this. Yeah, and we don't have, we're not seeing you, so go for it. Hand over your belly button, then fingers on your collarbone and just take a regular breath. Fingers under your nose, regular breath. Not one of those super duper big ones. On your chin, take a breath. And now reach around to your tailbone, if you can find it, <laughs> and take another breath. And just notice whatever you notice. Great. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. My shoulders are lower. Yes, I saw it happen. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to say that for me, um, in the area of self-care and mindfulness, the issue of breathing, just breathing, uh, instead of breathing from this down this low, you know, the top of your lungs to breathing all the way down to your diaphragm. And I've also learned that exhaling longer than you inhale can also calm us down which we can do while we're sitting with a client and it's self-care. Uh, so I just wanna, that's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, Essa, uh, Jessica is leaving for another meeting. You're very welcome. I'm glad you like this. Uh, on, if Chris is saying EFT, tapping emotional freedom technique. Um, so, uh we just have a little bit yeah anything else you wanted to say emily no i i just i i noticed the idea of box breathing to calm the body what's that go ahead we got a couple minutes that's all it's just that shell put that up there oh okay what is box breathing though if i don't know what it is what is it 
Well, so, Chilla, you want to explain it? Yeah, um, I have learned it from actually a lot of the victim advocates. Um, particularly those who are working with folks who are incarcerated because it's it's a strategy for just calming yourself and no one around you needs to know about it mm -hmm. um, where you imagine a box right you're breathing in for four counts you kind of move around the box I breathe out for four counts and then you can repeat it as many times as you need it it's just um, you know I I'm usually pretty chill, but I will have moments when I'm just very anxious and agitated. And it's just one of those ways where I can just try to regulate my body in a way that's just like, it's very personal. No one around you need to know. You can do it when you're driving. You could do it at the supermarket. You can do it anywhere. And, you know, it's really helpful to just get a, a starting point for, you know, the next part of your coping or, you know, self-care strategy. Mm -hmm. I have another one I can offer. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. This one I learned from Peter Levine, who's a somatic oriented therapist. I can't remember the name of his process, but if you take your right hand and put it under your left arm, you take your left arm and put it either on your shoulder or the top of your arm and just sit with it and just breathe and see what you notice, if anything. I don't know if anybody has a comment about it, but I can say for me, I feel more organized, more pulled together. Hmm. And I just, I'm just, regretful that I didn't remember to do these things before we started today. It was so hard to remember them. Yeah. I'm great at, you know, helping other people learn them, but it's, it, you know, self-care is a real challenge for me. Yeah. It's, this is just another reminder. Good. Yeah. Well, in our remaining minutes, I'd really like to hear from each of the participants Perf perf preferably voice-wise, but if you can't, then put it in the chat. Um, what you're taking away from this time together? Maybe I'll call on people that might be more efficient. Amy, what, what stays with you from being here today? Um. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed this last little piece in terms of self care. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, and I just appreciated the the overall conversation as it relates to uh, working with the accused and kind of more of a trauma informed approach. But um, for me, it's always in self care stuff at the end that ends up sticking with me. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> it was a good reminder. Great. And Chloe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I don't know, I guess I'm just going back to the piece in the video where they were talking about, I talked about this in the group in the um, breakout rooms, but I just think it was really impactful to hear like how much accountability really matters for healing. It's like something that like, of course I know, but I'm, I'm usually working with survivors and doing like trauma therapy. And I just, I feel like that often is like a missing a missing component and it's hard to give to people when like it doesn't exist for them necessarily like, sometimes it's just not possible but i think it's just important to keep in mind especially in like validating mm. survivors like need for that or desire for that you know and not minimizing it um so yeah just keeping that in mind great thanks gina how about for you what's staying with you from today it's always so hard to find the unmute button. Um, <laughs> it's always like so stressful. Where is it? Um, definitely all of the um, the resources that were shared um, and just the conversation of like bringing this back to management and having, having a larger conversation. And just like, it's reassuring to see that these like trainings and conversations are out there. Like that's super helpful for me because sometimes I feel like, um, uh, 
I'm all by my lonesome on an island and it's oh, nice yeah. to nice to connect with the other humans. We're with you. We're with you. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Nilika, hope I'm spelling, saying your name right. Can you unmute Nilika? How about Tia? Sorry, I also always struggle to find the unmute when my name is called <laughs> and I know where it is. <laughs> um, I also agree. So um, in reference to the self-care stuff always sticks with me uh -huh. um, because I always forget, right? Like I always tell folks that I see that you're taking care of yourself and here's a handout and um, but for my own self, that's something that I really, really struggle with, so. Great, thanks. And I just want to offer to all the Niscasa people that are here today, if any of you want to say what it was like to be in this um, workshop with us. Well, thank you. As always, Don, I love working with you. And this last bit on self-care is perfectly timed because I'm about to go launch a Zoom uh, with my vicarious trauma cohort group oh, of 12 great. folks that are diving deeply into working together with me for about 18 months wow. on how to mitigate vicarious trauma for themselves and their organizations and the work of doing victim services and um, related work, including oh, this type of work. Great. So. Um, yeah, thank you again. I'm gonna sign off in a minute, um, okay. but I'm so grateful for this chance to be with everyone here today and get to meet some new people that I've only seen on email. <laughs> great, great. Anybody else from Niscasa to sign off with something? Yeah, this is Chell. Um, I, I always find, you know, being able to hear from you really validating. And I think, you know, this conversation, um, you know, continues to be be that way. Um, it's really, I think, very wonderful to hear from folks thinking through, you know, what are the ways that we can, you know, work with people who've done harm in ways that are trauma informed and holistic and really healing focused, um, you know, and less like inherently punitive, right? Um, you know, how can we encourage people to right, be their best selves? Um, I think it's really um, hopeful for me. Great, great. Um, anybody else from Niscasa to say something? I just want to say it's it's been it's a great workshop session. I've learned a lot from learning from um, Emily about em empathy and how it's to connect, as well as your video and tying it all together. And I'm definitely the self care it always sticks with me, and yeah. no matter what setting we're in. So, and I thank you both. Oh, thank for, you. Um, Our pleasure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for having us. It's been a delight to be here. And I wish you all the best in the work you do. It's important. And please take good self care. Good, self lots of it. You can't do too much. <laughs> so, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.